Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this evening's webinar. Uh, we are taking a look at lichens in Mercer County Parks with lichenologist Dennis Waters. So I am so glad that you can join us today. I am trying to, here we go, great. Uh, my name is Kelly Ripkema. I am the Director of Environmental Education for the Mercer County Park Commission. Uh, we are, as I said, taking a virtual lichen walk today with Dennis Waters. This was originally scheduled to be a trail walk uh, in person on the trails with, uh, you know, magnifying loops and all of that. But of course, uh, we've had to adapt things with uh, the current situation. Um, so we adapted it as a special summer program. And I am so glad that you all could join us for this. So. Um, Tonight's presentation will be about 40 minutes long, and we will have question and answer following that. Um, as we've been doing all summer long, we ask that if you have any questions to go ahead and use the Q&A feature um, to type those in, and then we'll be able to get to them at the end of the presentation to answer all your questions. So if that is new to you, um, just hover your, uh, your cursor over the bottom of your screen. You should, uh, a toolbar should pop up and you'll see Q&A. If you open that up, then you can type in your question and it's just a really nice way for us to keep track of, of um, the questions that you have and uh, how we're answering them. If you have any technical difficulties, then leave those in the chat window. I will be monitoring that um, and I'll do my best um, to help you. We won't be monitoring any raised hands. So if it's a question, leave it in the Q&A. If it's some sort of technical difficulty, please leave it in the chat. So tonight we have with us Dennis Waters, who has been studying the lichens of central New Jersey for the past 12 years. He is a visiting scientist at the Chrysler Herbarium at Rutgers University, and he's written some papers. Some of the most recent ones include the first survey of the lichens of Mercer County, um, along with an updated checklist. So we are going to be able to enjoy um, his time, his efforts in researching these wonderful little chemical factories that we call lichens. So it, with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Dennis. So Dennis, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you, Kelly. It is absolutely a pleasure to be here, and uh, I'm glad to see some folks are with us tonight. Um, um, as Kelly was saying, for the last six summers, uh, I've had the privilege of leading lichen walks in a variety of Mercer County parks, and of course, we couldn't do that this year, so I'm going to try to do that virtually instead, and we will take a look at four of our county parks and see what lichens we can find there. And I'll also give you some tips on how to identify a few of the more common lichens that you will, uh, that you will uh, encounter. Before we get started, let's take a quick look at uh, Mercer County. Uh, so here's our county. Uh, Mercer County is about 230 square miles in area. And it's divided from northeast to southwest by the fall line that separates New Jersey's Piedmont physiographic province from the intercoastal plain. And that line roughly follows the US-1 highway um, uh, northeast from Trenton. So the green here is the coastal plain and the yellow up here is the Piedmont. And the two regions uh, differ in altitude and also in their underlying geology. And we'll see over the course of the next few minutes why that's important for lichens. The Piedmont is a bit higher in elevation and it's underlain by older rocks. The coastal plain is lower in elevation and is underlain mostly by gravel and sand. So these differences will affect the lichens that we'll see. There are very few lichens growing on rock in the coastal plain because there is not much rock there. Then from northwest to southeast, the county is divided by the line that separates the Delaware River and Raritan River watersheds. Everything to the left of this squiggly blue line um, flows to the Delaware River and everything to the right flows to the Raritan. Most of the county parkland is in the Delaware watershed, just a tiny bit in the Raritan watershed. 
Um, in 2013, the New Jersey Geological and Water Survey reported forest cover in Mercer County at about 18%. And this is good to know because many lichens grow on trees. The County Park Commission has parks in several different parts of the county, and we will visit these four. The first two are in the coastal plain and both in the Delaware watershed. Roebling Park is by the county's Tulpahaking Nature Center on the border of the Abbott Marshlands in Hamilton. Mercer County Park is in West Windsor and is mostly used for active recreation with ball fields and tennis courts and boating on Lake Mercer. The other two parks are on the Piedmont, Mercer Meadows in Lawrence and Hopewell on the lower elevations of the Piedmont and the watershed line between the Delaware and Raritan runs through this park. So some parts drain to one river and the rest drain to the other. And finally, Bald Pate Mountain is in the higher elevations of the Piedmont in the Delaware watershed where there are plenty of rocks for lichens to grow on. So a little bit about lichens. What most nature lovers know about lichens is that they are symbiotic organisms. This is an interdependent relationship between a fungus and some kind of photosynthetic partner, usually a green alga. And this is what's called an obligate relationship, meaning that neither one can survive without its partner. The green plant provides sugars, for the fungus to live on, and the fungus provides the green plant with protection from the elements. So there's a sense in which the fungus is engaged in a kind of agriculture, but it cultivates its crop inside its body, which is a very fungal thing to do. There are about 20,000 known species of lichen in the world, with about 5,000 known from North America. About 500 species have been found in New Jersey and 175 in Mercer County. But this evening, we'll look at just a few of the common or interesting ones. Now, most people have not taken the time to look closely at lichens, so they seem to look the same. But I think with a little practice, you can learn to tell the common ones from one another. The key differences are the substrate, what they grow on, on their color, on their growth form and on a few reproductive structures. And we'll talk more about all of these in just a little bit. Now, if you decide to go out and look at lichens, I recommend that you bring along a little hand lens. This is because many of the important characteristics are not quite visible to the naked eye unless you have exceptionally good vision. Lichens look very different with a little bit of magnification. And the lens that is used by most lichenologists is what's called a Hastings triplet with a 10 times magnification, a 10x magnification. And you can find these on Amazon for about 10 bucks. Just be sure to get the 10x magnification. So we'll get started. The first stop on our tour of the county parks is Roebling Park which is adjacent to the Delaware River floodplain and is also on the site of the White City Amusement Park of 100 years ago. Roebling Park features a mixed hardwood forest and lots of adjacent marshland. There are very few lichens in the marsh itself, but you can see quite a few in the forest. So you enter the park near the Tulpahaking Nature Center in Hamilton, and you head down a slope until you reach a parking area and an open grove of big oak trees. And sure enough, most of these trees have lichens growing on them. Now from this view, they may all look the same, but when you get closer and you get out your lens, you'll see then that there are several different species that are here on this oak. So now it is time for us to meet the major growth forms of lichens. There are three of them. They are crustose, folios, and fruticos. So crustos lichens kind of look like they've been spray painted onto their substrate. They don't have a true lower surface. And if you wanted to collect one and take it home with you, you'd have to take some of the substrate along with the lichen. Folios lichens are also flat, but they have more of a leaf-like appearance and have a true underside that can be peeled off the substrate. And then fruticose lichens are not flat at all, but they have a third dimension. 
Foliose and fruticose lichens are much easier to see and to identify, so we're going to concentrate on those this evening. A few crustose lichens will also show up along the way, but they won't be on the exam. Just kidding. So let's take a look at a couple of lichens on this oak tree at Roebling Park. Depending on your computer's monitor, you may be able to tell that there are two different things here with different colors. The one on the left is a lighter color, it's more of a yellow green, and the one on the right is more of a gray green. So what is the growth form of these two lichens? Well, it's foliose, leaf-like. You can see these leaf-like structures called lobes, you know, here along the edges of the lichen. So we'll start with the lighter colored one, the one that's more yellow green, and this is called Flavoparmelia caparata. And it is one of the two most common large foliose lichens that live on trees in Mercer County. You'll find Flavoparmelia in all of the county parks and probably on trees in your own neighborhood or maybe your own yard. With Flavoparmelia, we get an introduction to the first of three common reproductive structures that you will see. And these become quite obvious when you use your hand lens. So these are called soridia. They are like little granules or bits of dust, but each contains some fungus and some algae, a complete starter kit to begin a new lichen somewhere else. Ceridia look kind of like dust or pollen. I think of them as little Tootsie Roll pops with fungus on the outside and algae in the middle. They're produced inside the lichen and burst to the surface where they can be blown away by wind or washed away by water or carried off on the bodies of insects moving around in the environment. So these are all ceridia, all these little sort of powdery granular things. And a lichen that has these ceridia is called ceridiate. So Flavoparmelia caparata is a ceridiate lichen. And this one posed for a very nice portrait by my colleague, Jason Hollinger. To see the ceridia, you would look toward the center of the lichen. And if you see these little bumps in here, these are actually clumps of ceridia. But you don't need to see the ceridia to be able to know that this is a flavoparmelia. You just know it by its color. It's really the only big foliose lichen that grows on trees and has this yellow green color. And I should point out that most of the time you're not going to see lichens all dressed up and looking pretty like this one. Most of the time they look a little weathered and worn out like these at Roebling. So we've met this one here, which is Flavoparmelia. What about this other one? This is called Punctilia rudecta. And it's the other common large foliose lichen that grows on trees in central New Jersey. Its first distinguishing characteristic is its color, which is a kind of gray with maybe a little touch of green. And often the center is darker than the edge. If you see it after it rains, it looks quite a bit greener, but you should be able to tell punctilia from flavoparmelia strictly on the basis of color. Now with the punctilia, we meet the second kind of reproductive structure. So these are called ascidia, and they function like the ceridia that we just met. They look like tiny fingers, and they're designed to be broken off and carried away by wind, water, or insects. And each ascidiate finger contains some fungus and some algae, so it's already a miniature lichen ready to settle and grow somewhere else. So a lichen with ascidia is called ascidiate, it's unusual for a lichen to have both ceridia and ascidia. In fact, sometimes the way to differentiate between two species in the same genus is that one will have ascidia and the other will have ceridia. So Punctilia rudecta is a ceridiate, or uh, excuse me, an ascidiate lichen. And if you look toward the center of the lichen with your hand lens, you'll see the ascidia. These dark masses that you see here are clusters of ascidia, and they are the reason that Punctilia rudecta looks darker toward the center when seen with the naked eye. Now, before we leave Roebling Park, let's look along the edge of the parking lot, where there's a stumpy fence that's made of sawed-off telephone poles. 
these little poles are starting to weather a bit or maybe more than a bit and they're they're decaying and so this has become a habitat for lichens so now we're going to meet the second growth form we've already seen folios so now we're going to look at fruticose the folios and the crustos, as I said before, are both fairly flat lichens, but fruticose have a third dimension. They can grow up or out like little trees. This evening we'll meet several fruticose lichens, most of them in the same genus, which is Cladonia. So this is Cladonia massalenta, which looks like slim little fingers rising into the air. And in this habitat, sitting on top of this rotting pole, it is directly exposed to sunlight and it looks quite gray and dry. But when it grows in the shade in wetter conditions, it can look much greener. So Cladonia massalenta is the first of three kinds of fruticose Cladonia that we'll meet tonight. In the forest, you'll usually find it growing on decomposing logs or tree stumps. So now we're gonna leave Roebling Park behind and head to our second stop which is the Mercer County Park. Now, most people know the Mercer County Park in its southern area on the south side of Lake Mercer, where the hockey rink and the tennis courts and the cricket pitches are. But we're gonna visit the north shore of Lake Mercer, which you can reach from North Post Road in uh, West Windsor. This is where you find the Casperson Rowing Center, which is where young people develop their upper body strength. There's also a lot of forest on the north side of the lake with many miles of excellent trails. If you follow the trail behind the rowing center toward the lake shore, you'll enter a habitat that is one of the few spots in Mercer County where you can find a particular lichen. And that's this lichen. This is another kind of cladonia. Clendonia rangiferina, one of what are called the reindeer lichens. Now, I have only seen this lichen three places in Mercer County, and this is the one that's most accessible. One of the reasons that it grows here is that the soil is very poor. There's a lot of sand, much of it uh, dumped here after dredging Lake Mercer, and this is a lichen that grows almost exclusively on the ground. Seen up very close, this is a very attractive lichen and you can see that it's quite fruticose. It really has a third dimension. If you uh, visit the New Jersey Pine Barrens, you'll see a lot of Cladonia range of Farina covering the ground. The soil there is also very poor and sandy, so the conditions are good for that. Thanks to my friend Natalie Howe for this nice picture. And although it looks like it, this uh, forest is not in the Pine Barrens. This is actually in Finland. I mentioned that Cladonia rangiferina is one of the reindeer lichens. They are called this because they grow profusely above the Arctic Circle, where in the winter they're an important food source for reindeer herds. The reindeer paw through the snow to get to the lichens growing underneath. It was recently discovered that reindeer can see ultraviolet light, which allows them to see the lichens growing under the snow. People are often surprised to learn that 8%, 8% of the Earth's land surface is covered by lichen. Almost all of that is Arctic tundra that most of us never see, but if you were a reindeer, you wouldn't find that surprising. So the next stop on our park tour is going to be Mercer Meadows, and we will make two stops here. The first will be along the Lawrence Hopewell Trail behind the Hunt House on Blackwell Road, which is the headquarters of the Mercer County Park Commission. The Lawrence Hopewell Trail connects the Hunt House with Rosedale Lake. But on its way there, it goes by Willow Pond, where there's a little grove of oaks and some picnic tables down by the water. Willow Pond drains into Stony Brook, which is part of the Raritan River watershed. So this is the only location we'll visit that is not in the Delaware watershed. These oaks get some sunlight and plenty of moisture from the pond, and so they're a fine habitat for lichens. You may be wondering how lichens get their nutrition. The answer is they get everything they need directly from the air. Give them some moisture and some carbon dioxide, and they're pretty happy. 
So on the oaks by Willow Pond, you'll see the two lichens we met before at Roebling, Flavo parmelia caparata and Punctilia rudecta. But there are some other ones here as well. The first one is this. It's called Par Parmotrema hypotropum. It's one of the ruffle lichens. These are foliose lichens that grow on trees, but unlike the Flavo parmelia and the punctilia, they do not grow flat against the tree bark. Instead, they grow out from the tree, forming what look like ruffles. That's their ruffle lichens. There are several species of Parmotrema found in Mercer County, but this one's by far the most common. Often you'll see it growing on a tiny twig, which it kind of overwhelms. If you look closely at the edge of the lichen, you may be able to see clumps of ceridia. So this stuff here along the edge are all the ceridia. So this is a ceridiate lichen. But unlike the uh, Flavo parmelia that we saw before, this one has its ceridia along the edges of its lobes rather than in the middle. And you also may see what look like little whiskers along the edge. And these are called cilia. Sometimes the Parmotrema hypotropum will have just cilia and no ceridia, and sometimes ceridia but no cilia, and sometimes both like we see here. And no one knows why this is. Now, this is interesting. This is a Parmotrema from the tropics. Do you see anything unusual? Yes, this is an insect that is camouflaged to look like a Parmotrema. In Mercer County, we have only one insect that uses lichens for camouflage, and that is the lace wing larva. And I guess if you look like this, you'd want some camouflage too. So the lace wings go out and gather bits of lichen, in this case, a lichen in the genus Lepraria, so they can wander around without attracting predators. But if you turn them over, you can see the hiding place of the little larva. So if you're looking at a tree trunk and you see a tiny clump of lichen that starts to move, it is probably a lacewing larva. Returning to Willow Pond, you can see spots of yellow on some of the tree trunks. This is another common lichen called Candelaria concolor. It's a tiny foliose lichen. It's foliose, but the lobes are so small that you can only see them with your hand lens. So this is a ceridiate lichen also, with a few ceridia found at the tips of the lobes. You can kind of make those out in this photograph. But this is the only yellow foliose lichen in our area. So if it looks like this, you can be sure it's Candelaria concolor. Now this lichen, is quite fond of nitrogen, what is called a nitrophile. So you'll often find it on trees near farm fields where nitrogen fertilizer has been applied. And it can also be found growing alongside, uh, very often, a lichen called Fissia milligrana, and we will meet that lichen in a few minutes. In the Grove by Willow Pond, you'll also find lichens with the third major growth form, which is crustose. Crustose lichens, as I said, do not have an underside as such. They look like they've been spray painted onto the tree. A majority of the lichen species in Mercer County are crustose, but they tend to be small and difficult to see. So this white patch with the little red dots is Lecanora hybocarpa. It kind of looks like white paint has been applied to the tree. And the little red dots I'm speaking of are these right here. Here's a very nice portrait of Lecanora hybocarpa. So with this crustose lichen, we also get to meet the third of the three main reproductive structures we're looking for. So the red dots with the white rims are called apothecia, and they are the fruiting bodies where the lichen produces its spores. So apothecia come in many shapes. Lecanora hybocarpa has this one here with kind of a darker center and a, and a lighter colored rim. Others have a, are dark all the way around. 
Uh, some of them have little, uh, little designs on them. Some of them are long and skinny and almost look like handwriting. And some of them actually are mounted on tops of stalks of different kinds. If you were to, um, if you were to cut a slice through an apothecia and look at it under the microscope, you'd see something like this. Uh, this is the area in which the spores are produced in these structures right here. So with crustose lichens, it's all often very difficult to tell them apart without looking at the structure of the apothecia and the spores inside. This is what uh, lets you tell one species from another. But we're not going to do that tonight. Uh, we're going to go to another part of Mercer Meadows called the Pole Farm. But before we get there, we're, we'll stop right near the entrance to see a profusion of a very colorful lichen. So as you approach the pole farm from Cold Soil Road in Lawrence, you'll cross a small bridge across Shippetalkin Creek. And by the bridge is this wooden guardrail, which is the home to a whole bunch of the charismatic Cladonia cristatella, sometimes called the British soldier lichen because of its red caps. Like the Cladonia massalenta that we saw in Roebling Park, this one also likes decaying wood. And this is the largest batch of it that I know of in Mercer County. Like the other Cladonias, the British soldier is a fruticose lichen. But these red things, what are these red things on top? In fact, these are the lichens apothecia. They're fruiting bodies that produce spores. There are many kinds of Cladonia, many kinds of Cladonia. In Mercer County, there are about two dozen uh, right here. So this is the uh, Keefe Road parking lot at the pole farm. And our first stop is going to be right here on this concrete that's part of the drainage system. So you can see this little spot right here. If you look closely at it, you will see that there are crustose lichens growing on it. And these lichens are special for several reasons. Uh, for one, they are the first that we've seen growing on something like rock, uh, not a tree. Second, this is concrete, which has lime in it. So these are lichens that prefer to live on rocks that contain calcium rather than silicon. Now, there are no naturally occurring calcium rocks in Mercer County, things like limestone or dolomite. So we'll only find these lichens that enjoy calcium on structures that have been constructed by humans. So the, the lichen with the, uh, the crustose lichen with the orange dots is called Caloplaca ferricissima. And it's often found growing on concrete or in mortar on brick walls. Now here, the orange dots themselves, you may have guessed, are the apothecia, the fruiting bodies of the lichen. There are many kinds of caloplaca, but all the ones around here have orange dots of one kind or another. The other uh, crustose lichens growing here, uh, lichenologists have a technical term for these. We call them little black dots. Uh, in reality, there are many, many different lichens that produce little black dots. And it does require study with a microscope to figure out which one you have. I looked at these under the microscope, included that they are Sarcogyne regularis. As you might have guessed, the little black dots here are the apothecia, the fruiting bodies. One interesting thing about this lichen is that the only parts of the lichen that you can see are the apothecia. The rest of the lichen actually lives under the surface within the concrete. Lichens like this are called endolithic, which means inside the rock. And if you give them long enough, a eh, thousand years or so, they will eventually reduce this back to a dirt again. So further on into the pole farm, uh, you can follow the Lawrence Hopewell Trail and look at trees along the way. These trees have several of the lichens. These are maples. Uh, there are several of the lichens that we've met already. The yellow green one here is Flavoparmelia copperata. The ruffled one over here and here, that's our uh, Parmotrema hypotropum. And the one that's darker here in the middle is the uh, Punctilia rudecta. 
But many of the trees have a lichen that we have not met yet, and that is Fissia milligrana. Fissia milligrana is another folios lichen, but it has lobes like the Candelaria concolor that we saw before. The lobes are so small that you can't really see them without magnification. And you'll also see some granular ceridia along the edges of the lobes. Fissia milligrana is a lichen that can have more than one reproductive structure. We saw ceridia on the last slide, but sometimes we also have apothecia like this one right here. Uh, so Fissia milligrana is a very urban lichen. You'll find this growing on street trees in Philadelphia and New York, and it will grow on almost anything. Here's some Fissia milligrana growing on an old car. So if there is any kind of fresh surface, this is gonna be one of the first lichens to colonize that surface. So now we'll move on to our final stop on our tour of Mercer County Parks. We're going to Bald Pate Mountain, which is the highest point in the county, 450 feet high. And we will make two stops at Bald Pate to reflect two different kinds of rock found there. And the first stop will be the trails off Pleasant Valley Road. So if you walk a short distance down this trail, which is called the Ridge Trail, you'll come to a big field of boulders. And the boulders are made of a rock called diabase. So what is diabase? In this uh, simplified geological map of Mercer County, you see the coastal plain down here in dark green, the Piedmont up here in light green, but the diabase ridges are right here and they're in pink. So this is, uh, this is Bald Pate, this is Pennington Mountain, this is Mount Rose with the Princeton Ridge running to the east from there. And these are the Sourlands up here. Um, these are all made of diabase, which is an igneous volcanic rock. Jericho Mountain and Bowman's Hill over in Bucks County are also made of diabase. So the diabase ridges are home to a unique community of lichens. I can't get into all of the details here, but they are in a paper that we published last year on the lichens of Mercer County. And that paper is free to download. And I will ask Kelly uh, to put the link into the chat box if you'd like to investigate further. You can download it and read it at your leisure. As you can see, this diabase boulder has lichens on it. Uh, it's got some gray patches and also these smaller greenish things. So we'll start with the gray patches. This crustose lichen is called Porpidia albocyrulescens, and that is a mouthful. There's enough syllables there to name two or three lichens. Um, if you look at it with your lens, you'll see these little black dots with the uh, gray, they're more actually gray dots with black rims. And if you guess that these are the apothecia, you are correct. This Porpidia is the most common rock-dwelling crustose lichen in Mercer County. And it's actually quite beautiful. Because of these apothecia, it is sometimes called the smoky-eyed lichen. The sort of gray color that you see on the top here is caused by uh, tiny crystals that grow on top of the uh, apothecia. And sometimes this makes very nice patterns on the rock. In case you're wondering, these are all individual lichens, and they are competing with each other for territory. If you took a close look at the borders between them, you would see constant skirmishing going. Lichens skirmish with chemicals, their own brand of chemical warfare. And many lichens are remarkable little chemical factories, as Kelly said earlier. One of the reasons lichens don't get eaten very much is that they produce so many unpleasant chemicals. Almost a thousand different chemical compounds have been found in lichens, many of which are found nowhere else in nature. This lichen that we're looking at here is called Rosella. This is not a Mercer County lichen, but it is the source of one of the most famous chemical compounds derived from lichens, and that is litmus. The litmus paper that you used in high school chemistry to give rough, a rough measure of pH is actually an extract from a lichen. 
In many cases, the only way to tell one lichen from another is through their chemistry. Two lichens may look exactly the same and yet have very different chemistries. Some of the chemicals are fluorescent and can be distinguished by the use of ultraviolet light. And this photo is a good example. This is the same tree branch with the upper half in visible light and the lower half in ultraviolet light. The crustose lichens on the top all look pretty much the same, like a white stain. But on the bottom, you see the fluorescent colors that show them all to be different species containing different chemicals that fluoresce differently. Anyway, back to bald pate. The other lichen on this diabase boulder is one of the few lichens that is equally happy growing on rocks or on trees. And that is another mouthful which is called Phaeophysia rubropulchra. This is another folios lichen, as you can see, it looks leaf-like with very small lobes and it also has ceridia. These patches here are the ceridia. It's one of the easiest lichens to identify because if you nick the surface, you will see that the interior of the lichen is bright orange. There's no other lichen around here that is orange on the inside. However, Phaeophysia rubropulchra can vary in exterior color. This one is kind of a gray green but this one is more of a brown. And when it grows in direct sunlight, it can be jet black. You can see though that it's a phaeophysia. You can see the little nick here and the patch of orange. You'll also notice that it sometimes has apothecia as well as ceridia. So now we're gonna jump over the mountain, directly on the other side of Bald Pate Mountain to the Coozer Trail off of Church Road in Hopewell. So if you follow that trail in a ways, you'll come to Fiddler's Creek, which drains to the Delaware River near Titusville. And this side of the mountain has a very different geology from the side that we started with. You won't find any igneous diabase over here. If you explore along the creek, you will see layers of shale, which is a sedimentary rock that was laid down in the Triassic period over 200 million years ago. In some parts of New Jersey, this layer of shale is two miles deep. There's a lot of it. And these Triassic shales also support a unique lichen community, which you can read about also if you download our Mercer County lichen paper. This lichen is not unique, however. This is our old friend, the smoky-eyed lichen, Porpidia albocyrulescens. You can see the apothecia right in here. However, this lichen is quite unique in Mercer County. I've only seen it at uh, Fiddler's Creek. This is Colima subflaxidum. It is one of the few lichens that likes to get wet. It's usually found in stream channels where it is submerged when the water is high. So Colima subflaxidum is a folios lichen and it is also acidiate. So it's got the little fingers and you can see the acidia growing on the surface of the lobes. But what makes it really unusual in Mercer County is that Colima is called a cyanolichen. All the lichens we've seen so far are a partnership between fungus and a green algae. This one, however, is a partnership between a fungus and a cyanobacterium, which is a more primitive organism. Uh, those of us of a certain age remember calling these things blue-green algae. So of the roughly 175 species of lichen in Mercer County, only five of them are cyanolichens and all of them are uncommon. When I was on the trail to Fiddler's Creek, I saw these fallen branches lying on the ground. It's always a good idea to pick up fallen branches to see what lichens are growing there. It's kind of a joke among lichenologists that we know an awful lot about lichens that grow on tree trunks between ground level and about six feet high. But we don't know nearly as much about the lichens that grow near the tops of the trees and the canopy because we don't get up there much. The only way we find out about them is to look at branches that have fallen from the canopy. And at Fiddler's Creek, I saw this fallen branch and lo and behold, there was a rare lichen on it. Can you pick out the rare lichen? It's this fuzzy stuff right here. This is a fruticose lichen but it's the first one we have seen that is not a cladonia. 
This is Usnea mutabilis. If the tree branch hadn't fallen down, I never would have known it was there. So Usnea is a big genus. And if you travel up to New England or Canada, you'll see many different species in the boreal forest. But in central New Jersey, we have only a couple of species and this Usnea mutabilis is one of them. One thing that makes it distinctive is this pink cord that runs down the middle of its little stems. That's an interesting color. One question that often comes up, and that is whether people eat lichens. The general answer is not unless they have to. But despite that, some Scandinavian and South Asian restaurants do serve it on occasion. However, you should bear in mind the helpful hint uh, here in this article that the best way to prepare lichen is to remove it from the stomach of a freshly killed reindeer. However, if you visit a South Asian supermarket, you will almost certainly find lichen among the spices. It's usually called stone flour. And as you might imagine, it has an earthy taste. This is actually a species of Parmotrema related to our own Parmotrema hypotropum. In Nepal, uh, a lichen mixture called yangben is used in cooking. It takes on flavor by absorbing fat from whatever meat it is cooked with. Here is a Nepalese woman sorting and preparing yangben. And should you visit Iceland, you will find a liqueur there that contains lichen. You can see it here in the bottom of the bottle. This is a lichen called Citraria islandica. Tequila and mezcal sometimes have a worm in the bottle, uh, so this may be an improvement. Uh, I'll invite you to ask some questions in a moment, but first I'll invite you to download our paper on the lichens of Mercer County. It has a complete list of everything we found and the various habitats in the county where lichens grow, and that is in the chat room. And with that, I would like to thank my colleague James Lendemer at the New York Botanical Garden, also Mercer County Parks and the DNR Greenway for letting me study their properties and others who have contributed to this project. And with that, I believe I will open things up for questions. So if you have questions, I think you should put them in the, um, uh, in the Q&A. And here we go. This yes. is fantastic, someone says, but that's not a question. <laughs> Um, I had a question, if I could ask it. Um, I was curious, so you mentioned that the lichens are chemical factories. Um, what are, how are some ways that we have benefited from them? Besides well, litmus. Besides litmus. Um, Which is new, I had no, I did not know that. Well, it, it's, it's interesting, the, um, the, uh, there is actually work being done um, to, uh, uh, on some of these chemicals for medicinal properties. Uh, they, uh, there's, there's pharmaceutical work being done, particularly on uh, the possibility that they might be uh, uh, use, useful as cancer drugs. Uh, there's, nothing, uh, that there's, there's nothing that's, uh, that's anywhere close to the clinic from that kind of thing right now, but, uh, but that is one thing that is going on. You know, I'd, I'd point out too that the chemicals and the action of the lichens uh, one of the main benefits that we have in our uh, in our uh, in our ecosystem is that uh, when you go up to diabase boulders like you see at uh, at Baldpate, you know over the course of geologic time, I mean we're talking thousands of years here, these lichens that are growing on the boulders will in fact reduce those boulders back to soil. So lichens are very important as uh, as uh, decomposers of rock, uh, but it takes a long time. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it looks like there's a couple of additional questions here. Um, so we have uh, a question uh, given all the unpleasant chemicals, eating and drinking lichen seems to be a dubious endeavor. Um, I would say uh, it's again not, uh, not recommended. Uh, however, there are cuisines that have used it. Uh, Native Americans use certain lichens uh, for, uh, to make tea and that kind of thing. So some, some of them aren't quite as chemically laden as others. So they're not all equally awful, but, um, 
but uh, but generally speaking, uh, if you tr get a package of lichen at your South Asian supermarket, and you you can try it pretty safely. <laughs> um, question: I have heard that if one finds lichens growing, then that is an indication of lesser pollution in the area. Is this correct? Uh, yes, as a general rule, it is. Now, most of the lichens that we looked at this evening are fairly common lichens. So they are not, um, uh, they are not really indicators of, of good air. You, like the, the Fissia melagrana that I mentioned, you're going to find that growing in the, in the most difficult conditions. But there are a number of species of lichen that are, uh, that are quite sensitive to air pollution. Uh, the United States Forest Service has a long-standing program of using lichens for air quality monitoring. As a matter of fact, I'm involved in a study right now uh, down in the Abbott marshlands, uh, both in Roebling Park and in some of the park areas around the Abbott marshlands, uh, to see uh, what lichens are there. Because as you, uh, as you may know, the uh, Mercer generating station that PSE&G ran since about 1960 was for many years the largest point source of, of, of sulfur dioxide in the state of New Jersey. And I guess that's saying something. Um, but they, they shut that plant down a couple of years ago and the air quality across the Abbott marshlands as a result is, uh, is improving. So what I'm trying to do is develop a baseline of the lichens that are there currently. And hopefully someone will be able to come back in another 20 years or so and, um, and see what lichens are there and see if their populations have, uh, have rebounded and see if there are any, uh, any, uh, any uh, unique or interesting lichens that have found their way in there with the better quality air. I see. Uh, here's a question. I have lichen growing on my wooden mailbox. What kind might that be? I'd have to take a look. Hard to, <laughs> lots of things can grow on, uh, lots of things can grow on, uh, on uh, wood. Uh, wood is a very good substrate for lichens. I have to share, I was so tickled. Dennis, you already know this, but um, I, I just happened to look at my, I have a really old fence and I had some of those little red, um, the, what is it called? The British soldier? British soldiers, soldier? yeah, sure, sure. British Clodonia Christatella. Say that five times fast. Um, <laughs> So I invite you all to take a look around your, your home, your mailbox or your fence and see what you can find. You never know. Sure, sure. Um, here's a question. Have lichens ever been used as an indicator of forest or tree age? Uh, I don't know uh, of, an in, of them used as a direct indicator of forest age or tree age, but there is, uh, there is a field, believe it or not, called lichenometry in which lichens are used as an indicator of the age of rocks. Uh, this has become particularly useful uh, with climate change because uh, there are certain lichens for which the growth rate of the lichen is a known number. And so if you measure the size of the lichen, you can tell how long the lichen has been on the rock and exposed to, a exposed to air. So uh, up north, uh, when glaciers are receding, you can imagine a glacier that is sort of receding and then the rocks that have been underneath the glacier for hundreds of thousands of years potentially are exposed to the air for the first time and immediately lichens will start growing on them. So if you find those rocks, uh, you can look at the size of the lichens that are growing there and that will give you an indication of how long ago those rocks were first exposed to the air, which you can use to help calculate how rapidly that, uh, that glacier is receding. But I don't know of any uh, situations in which they are used specifically uh, to, to, to date for us, although there are certainly uh, lichen species that, uh, that thrive really in only very, very old forests. So if you find certain lichens, you'll know that you're at least in an old, in an old forest. Okay. Uh, question is, is lichen dangerous for a tree? Will it kill trees? Uh, this is a very common question and it's, it's, the answer is kind of interesting because the, um, 
uh, you often see a tree that doesn't look so healthy and you see a lot of lichens on the tree and then you say, oh my, this tree is being damaged by the lichens. But actually, when you see that, you've got the causality exactly backwards because a tree that is not healthy does not have, uh, does not have healthy foliage, is not going to leaf out quite as much, which lets more light come mm -hmm. through the crown of the tree and down to the trunk and to the branches. And because more light is falling on the tree trunk, that uh, provides a better habitat for lichens. So lichens in this case can be an indication that the tree is not healthy, but it's not because of the lichens. The lichens are actually thriving there because the tree is not healthy. A uh, question, what were lichens evolution processes compared to other fungi? And um, uh, that, that's an ongoing study. Uh, the uh, many lichens are known to, or let's say many fungi. Well, well, the, 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 the interesting thing about lichens, one of the many interesting things about lichens is that, um, is that they are named after the fungal partner. Remember there's, two parts. There's a fungus and then there's some kind of a green photosynthetic organism. Uh, but it's the, uh, it's the fungus that is the official name of the lichen. So there's about 20,000 different fungi that become lichenized. And, the, um, and, the, uh, and over the course of evolutionary time, it's been determined that many fungi become lichenized and then they stop being lichenized and maybe they become lichenized again. So it is not, a, it seems to be a common, you know, 20, there, uh, there's about 100,000 species of fungi. So lichens themselves are about 20% of all of the known fungi. So you have to think that this is a fairly, you know, a fairly common uh, condition for them to live in. And in fact, many lichens have, or many fungi have become lichenized. Some stop being lichenized and live as, uh, as free living fungi. Uh, so this process has gone back and forth uh, over, the, uh, over the millennia. Uh, the oldest known lichen um, that I'm aware of uh, was discovered in China and it's a lichen fossil that is about 400 million years old. So that's, uh, they, they do go back quite a, quite a ways. It sounds like there's a whole lot more to the story than just a simple symbiosis between, or mutualism, or whatever the relationship is between the, the alga and the fungus. Oh yeah, there is a lot going on there. And, and um, you know, there's a real shortage of lichenologists. So if you know any young people who are, uh, who are interested in natural history, please encourage them to become lichenologists. We need all the help we can get. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, question, have you found any unusual lichens on gravestones? I have not uh, studied gravestones in, uh, in Mercer County, particularly um, the, uh, the, the lichens on, but however, lichens are studied on gravestones. Uh, unfortunately, a lot, of, uh, a lot of cemeteries think they're ugly and, and you know, and, and sandblast them off and clean the gravestones off. Uh, there are some studies that have taken place that um, to use to study the growth of lichens, the kind of data on how rapidly a lichen will grow uh, by using a specific gravestone and going back and revisiting. Um, there's, a, uh, there's a scientist who was at Harvard and is now at the University of Wisconsin. Um, any uh, name escapes me at the moment, but uh, but she is she has done quite a lot of work uh, studying. Uh, she goes back to the same gravestones every year and studies the specific lichens and how much they've grown and which ones are winning in the battle among lichens and all that kind of thing. Uh, question: Why do lichens prefer to use scientific names to common names? Uh, I hear this question a lot, and uh, the reality is that, um, you know, if you study birds or you study wildflowers or you study butterflies, 
you know, you've got common names to go with just about everything. And with lichens, there have never really been, with a few exceptions like the British soldier lichen and the reindeer lichen and things like that, there have never really been any, uh, any common names attached to the lichens. So just about everybody uses the, uh, uses the scientific names. There have been a few attempts made to uh, come up with common names. If you look at the big, um, the big book called Lichens of North America uh, that was published about 20 years ago, which is a gorgeous book, by the way. Um, and the, uh, that, they did try to give common names to lichens. Some of them have stuck a little bit. For the most part, they have not. So scientific names are what we use, and, and you just get used to it after a while. Let's see what else we have here. Uh, question, can one encourage lichen growth? Um, the, uh, I, I, I don't know of anybody who has been successful in cultivating lichens. I mean, I know you can grow a moss garden and you can, uh, you can have, uh, and you can, you can grow, grow other kinds of fungi, but I don't know of anyone who's been that successful in cultivating lichens as such. That said, there is work being done on that for a very specific reason. Um, uh, the, um, there's an area in eastern North Carolina, uh, not on the Outer Banks proper, not on the, on the barrier islands, but actually on the mainland of North Carolina, right inside of where the barrier islands are, uh, which has become a, a biodiversity hotspot for lichens. There are an enormous number of lichens there, many of which are found only there. Um, and uh, the unfortunate thing with climate change is that, that th those areas are really only a few inches above sea level. And as, uh, as the sea rises, it's going to endanger all of those lichens. So there is work being done to see if it's possible to, to transplant and establish populations of those lichens in, uh, in higher elevations up on the Piedmont and that kind of thing. Can I jump in with a quick question from um, Margaret? She, um, she asked if there's any lichen species that are harmful to touch. Uh, no, there aren't. You, can, uh, you should be able to touch any lichen okay. and maybe it'll touch you back. <laughs> I have a couple more questions here. Uh, will lichen on cement weaken it and should it be cleaned off? Uh, in the long run, yes, it will weaken it. Um, uh, in the short run, not really. Uh, it's not really, uh, it's not really going to be a problem. Um, question, is there a process similar to ecological succession seen with lichens that are found on rocks? That is under study. I think I mentioned the, uh, the woman who is uh, Annie Pritchard, I think is her name. Now that finally came to me. Uh, who studies the gravestones. So she is looking at if you've got two different species of lichen that are doing this with each other um, and fighting for territory, which one is going to be victorious um, and who's got the best chemicals and all those sorts of questions. So, that's, uh, so that is some study that's being done in that area. And uh, one final question I see here, are there fossilized lichens? And, um, and the answer is yes, uh, not many, but they have been found. Some of them have been found in amber, but as you can imagine, these are not things that fossilize all that well. But there are a few of them, and, uh, and as I said, the oldest ones have been uh, found that are about 400 million years old. Okay. Well, that wraps up all the questions that we had in our uh, Q&A panel so far. I want to thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you, Dennis, so much for showing us those fantastic pictures of the lichens. I never realized they were so intricate and, and colorful and beautiful. Um, we are, if you liked this, then please tune in, uh, stick with us for the fall. We are putting together a fall lecture series that will be the third 
Thursday of every month, September, October, and November. Our first one is September 17th, and we will be talking about the diurnal and nocturnal creatures of the Abbott marshlands with a focus on some of the different adaptations that these various animals use to live in those very different uh, environments. We sure hope to see you again, um, and thank you again for joining us. Good night, everyone. Thank you.